recording. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I would like to welcome Dana and Brian Finster to the January edition of the DevOps Online Meetup. So this is the DevOps Patterns and Anti-Patterns discussion. I think this is going to be fun. So just a reminder that the DevOps Online Summit is coming up April 26th through the 30th. So with a call for speakers is out. If you go to bit.ly slash DOS dash CFS, and we'll put that in the, I'll put that in the chat for everyone to see. But uh, Dana and Brian, I really appreciate your time. Appreciate you guys being track chairs. Um, if you guys just, you know, I'm thinking most people know who you are, but if you want to introduce yourself and of course, tell us about your track. I'm, I'm really excited. I, when you guys told me about this, I was, you know, I thought this was going to be fun. <laughs> you want to go first? Sure, I'm Dana Finster. I've been a developer for over 20 years and uh, recently the past uh, four or five years really um, invested a lot of my time and efforts into uh, DevOps, continuous delivery and educating teams. So um, that's kind of where we're coming from with this. And um, I'll let Brian introduce himself and then we can talk a little bit about the, the track because I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'm Brian Finster. I've also been a developer for over 20 years, uh, and I, I lead the DevOps strategy for a large enterprise, and I, I get to see a lot of those patterns and anti patterns every single day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think um, you know, I, I kind of I, patterns and anti patterns just kind of inspired me for a track. Um, there's lots of tracks that are very specific into technologies or specific into practices. Um, but some of the things that have most inspired me uh, throughout um, my career have been reading books like The Phoenix Project or The Unicorn Project, and more recently, Sooner, Safer, Happier. Um, and I realized I think it's really compelling when you start hearing, when you see the anti-patterns and they make you cringe. And then you kind of can learn from there how to fix that, right? Versus just, this is what you should do. This is what you should do. This is what you, you know, this is what we did. It might work for you. Um, I thought this would be an interesting track that we could throw out that would be something where we can have discussions around, you know, anything related to the entire flow of, of DevOps and the entire value stream that organizations have. And that it's not limited, but then, uh, you know, also, hoping that it'll provide an opportunity to have some really fun, engaging discussions and talks. Yeah, and, and really from my perspective, uh, you know, once you've been in this for a while, you start to look at some of the things that it, it's honestly, the, the core principles we're trying to do are not that hard if people really understood what they were and kind of just felt them in their bones. And, you know, everyone's, everyone overcomplicates DevOps. Everybody overcomplicates continuous delivery. It's really just very, really simple at its core. Um, and if we can show people what the things to avoid, what the pitfalls are, uh, and then kind of really get to the core of explaining what, what it is we're trying to accomplish, the patterns to look for, um, and understand things like, hey, if your team structure is wrong, you're fighting, uh, you're fighting your organization just to So yeah, I mean, it's it's just that the the the, the faster we can get to the core of what this is trying to get done, the, the faster we can improve the entire industry. Yeah, that's awesome. I, when you guys told me, I remember Dana and I were talking about this initially, uh, this, you know, just sounded like a, a great idea. So I guess we have a lot of people here who want to join us. Uh, feel free to, you know, if you want to put a question in the chat or you can come on, uh, put on your video and ask uh, Brian and Dana, I know they're friendly people. They won't, they won't bite or hurt you. So They'd be happy to answer your questions about the track. I know we got a lot of good people on. Like I said, a lot of people registered for this. So feel free I to know, jump unless in. Unless you get my way of delivery, in which case I might. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody have any thoughts around this? Anything that you guys have seen that uh, it's like, wow, I wish we wouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> Got Corey, Pradeep, Cameron, Kaz, Don, Donald. We have two people named guests, interestingly enough. Jorge, we know you. What a coincidence. Yeah. Well, I know you've never seen any pain. 
I'm just tired of doing things manually. Yeah. Yeah, are we all? <laughs> what about weekend deployments? Oh, you shouldn't have to do those. That's That's I agree with you. I see that <laughs> yeah. happen all the These time. These are all great answer patterns. You know, I was, I was talking to a team yesterday and they were asking about, uh, well, I mean, how, what, you know, how do we, you know, how do we handle after hours deployments? I said, don't. So well, we have to take an outage. I'm like, you don't? I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, like, I, I said, those are actually, those aren't features, those are defects. So what's the yeah. engineering solution to those? <laughs> I, I had somebody tell me they want their teams to be able to go to church on Sunday rather than troubleshooting software. I'm like, I agree. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I talk about uh, a, a lot, you know, uh, one of the things that really riles me up is when somebody throws like code coverage as a goal. And uh, because I've personally seen like 900 lines of Java covered with a cert true. So I know that code coverage is BS. Uh, and so I, I tell people, hey, you know what? If you want to really demonstrate your confidence in your tests, then tell me that you can deploy carrying the pager on your way on Friday night to take your wife out for a date. <laughs> and then you know you have quality. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's, that's your metric. It just like the code coverage falls under the greater category of reports. And I've just seen so many reports be wrong and decisions be made off of wrong reports. It, it always kind of worries me. Yeah. And that's, um, I, I advise anybody who wants to get into this to become um, best friends with testing and appropriate use of metrics that uh, I've seen a lot of destructive behavior because of inappropriate message usage, you know, where teams are just incentivized to do the wrong thing. And teams will do exactly what you ask them to do. They'll do exactly what you measure them to do. And I always encourage people to measure for customer value. You don't measure for HR value. Um, customer didn't care about your HR value. And your bottom line does care about the customer value. So let's focus on that. You know, what are our outcomes we're aiming for? Yeah, metrics can be useful, but you have to think about how humans are using them and how the system is actually working. And yeah, don't be trust evil. it blindly. Yeah, don't don't be evil and actually understand what's behind that metric. Understand the data quality behind that metric. Understand what it really means, what it doesn't mean. <laughs> so Jorge has a good question. What would be a good pattern to scale DevOps to a large enterprise? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, first, I think everyone should align on a better definition of DevOps. There's, it's the most overloaded word in the, in the industry as far as I can tell. Uh, we use Donovan Brown's definition, which is, you know, the union of people, process, and product to enable the continuous delivery of value to the end user. Given that definition of DevOps, DevOps is the entire flow of delivery through the organization to deliver value to the end user. And so if you're organizing around value streams, uh, anybody gets an email from me, you'll see it. My, I've self-appointed myself a title value stream architect. Uh, Mick Kirsten introduced that, and I really thought it was really what we're trying to do is improve the flow of value. So if you organize around value streams, instead of organizing around roles and function, organize to customer delivery, then that's the first step of DevOps right there. I mean, you, you, hey, we're, we're focusing on helping each other deliver value instead of focusing on my kingdom. <laughs> So true. Uh, hey, scaling. Hey, hey. Oh, actually, I'm writing a paper right now for IT Revolution on scaling DevOps. And uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's at least my view of it. So, you know, like I said, I lead a DevOps dojo, and a lot of large enterprises are using dojos to help up skill teams. Now, if you're a medium-sized enterprise, you can get that done in a reasonable amount of time. But in a large enterprise, uh, you're constantly doing that because team rotation, and you never get everybody. And it, it's incredibly expensive. It doesn't scale. Now, where I work, we're paying for this on margin on bananas. So I got to make sure that that we. And plus, it's my bonus. If I'm, I can't just throw money away. I'm incentivized by company performance. That's my money I'm throwing away. So I got to make sure we don't do that. And so the idea that uh, I came up with was, all right, look, we can either vertically scale the dojo a lot the way a lot of other companies have done, or we can horizontally scale the capability across the enterprise. We can come up with a disciplined approach to certifying that people know how to be value stream architects, to be able to help 
uh, help teams help all the way down with how to test better all the way up to how do we organize the teams better? How do we get people talking better? Uh, everything. How do we architect the better flow of delivery through this particular value stream in that context? And because that's what my team does. So why can't we teach other people to do it? And so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're working on that right now. We've got uh, online training to get people level set on what the goals are, what it is we're trying to accomplish and what the disciplined approach should be. And then mentoring people as they go run improvement projects under us. And then when they've, they've successfully completed improvement projects, then, you know, they, they, they are now certified value stream architects in that area, watching that area, helping that area and just embedded into the culture of the enterprise versus having it a center of excellence, which I've never wanted us to be. That's where good ideas go to die. Uh, and, and that way we can get those green belts to become black belts who can train other green belts and just grow it that way and have that guild of people who are operating the same way on the same goals to improve delivery the same way. Yeah. And by scaling horizontally, you get the ability to scale the principles out in a way that pertains correctly to the various contexts that exist within the organization versus a single entity trying to understand the various contexts and different things that happen within the organization from a single point. You, you really get a lot more knowledge and, and domain knowledge, specialty knowledge stretched across the entire organization with the same founding principles from it coming all from the same place. Yeah. Um, I, I think that has legs. I think that that scales a lot better than trying to vertically scale a dojo. I think the dojo is still important because we uh, have the ability to have a more strategic view of the entire enterprise instead of looking at one area and to help coordinate all that effort and to be the certifying body to make sure everyone's mm -hmm. pulling the same way. But you don't have to have a big organization to get that done. Fingers crossed. Um, constant battle of how to handle the constant battle of change management versus having a low lead time for deployments is the next question. So Lewis, can you clarify when you say change management, there's two things that come to mind. One is managing the change the customer sees and the other one is cab. Which one do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so more of the cab side of it. So our, oh. at least within my organization, they want to have a lead time of two to four weeks versus I'm going to the DevOps handbook and they're looking for deployments in hours. <laughs> Just kind so of they, trying to merge the two together. You, you don't, you eliminate cab. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, we're trying to drop batch size because smaller batches are easier to make sure they're high quality. And when they're poor quality, they fail small. I, I always hate fail fast. That's terrible. It's fail small. Uh, and if we're focusing on failing small, we have to do it a lot because otherwise we won't go very fast at all. Um, and anything in the organization, so let me just back up a second. Our job as an organization is to deliver customer value. We are responsible for making it more efficient and more effective at delivering customer value. We look around at things that make us slower and less efficient. Those are against the goals and they're wrong. Uh, cab increases the batch size because it's, it increases the cost and reduces the efficiency of delivery so that you're going to have larger batches of flow because you don't want to do that very often because it just costs too much money to get done. So you, you, you can't, it, it's just a block and it decreases quality. It's, it's doing the opposite of what it's intended to do. And the people in the CAD meeting, what do they know about the change? They don't know anything about the change. They didn't make the change. So what you do is you start working with the people in CAB and say, okay, I know that this, you think this is important. What value are we trying to get out of that? And why can't we automate this value? Why can't we put those checks into the pipelines and have the pipelines certify the code is good? CD is not about build and deploy automation. CD is about having a flow that uh, prevents bad things from going to production. And that could be with us saying that's the wrong thing to do, or it could be the pipeline saying this doesn't meet our standards of quality, security, compliance, everything. And so it's, it takes time to work on them. But when you start showing them the cost of what they're doing and then ask them to justify the value in measurable terms, they're going to struggle. 
You know, it's uh, you got some great points there. Well, all those points are awesome. I love the aspect of trying to eliminate the cab inside of an organization, which it needs to happen because mm-hmm. they're friction and creating value, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things I've seen people do is um, having a plan that, because you, know, you have to be prepared, obviously. Cabs are trying to mitigate risk, but they are risk. And if you have a way to throttle, right. r- reduce risk, then you are solving that problem. And that's what allows you to be able to deliver whenever the heck you want. And that's what you should be doing. Um, obviously with controls and delivery and and being able to hit a toggle switch off to get back out of that yeah. situation. Okay. It's a huge yeah. culture change though, because I, like in my last company uh, where I worked with Brian, I remember some huge battles and conversations between different people with different philosophies where people were like, you can't, just not have a change control that's not how we do things they're acting like it would be driving on a highway without a seat belt they just thought it was the worst thing ever and you can't just like explain your position and expect them to change you have to prove it you have to start automating the deployment you have to start implementing testing and make it such that it's obvious that the change is pointless because it hasn't failed yeah, I mean, people, this, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I have a really hard time in talking to people. And I find that the, the concept that I find the most issues getting across to people is that you're, if you're deploying really small, you know, it's, it's fail small, right? Or deploy small. Um, the smaller something is, the less risk it is. It's just inherent. And when you talk about getting rid of cab, they say, oh, well now all these big changes are gonna go through and we're gonna keep working the way we're working and we're gonna miss out on being able to look over all this code when they're not understanding that this code is going out in these tiny, tiny iterations that are just inherently lower risk. And to Donald's point, you kind of have to show that and show how resilient it can be. The fail small means fix really fast. (laughs) <laughs> well, in, in, but Dana brings up a really good point. It should be small, low risk changes, but it's not just CAB has to change their mind. It's also the development teams. And so mm-hmm. you, what, what I would recommend is that you negotiate with change management, that you use change management as the boogeyman to drive down batch size and say, okay, look, if you have a standard change that's low risk, no outage, that's small, I mean, even things like it's under this many lines of code delta, uh, it, it, whatever, you know, negotiate with change management. Say this, let's define what a standard change looks like in a measurable way. And then if you're not doing a standard change, then you have to go to cab, right? And, but all the people that do have a standard change get automated change management where we just announce change and their lives are better and they, they hop and skip around the offices and, and, and miss cab meeting and go have beer early. And <laughs> that, that, uh, that's, you know, that's the carrot stick thing. It's like you can have a good life or you can choose to operate the way you're operating now. But if you want to learn how to do actual continuous delivery, then you'll have low risk change and you don't have to go to cab meetings anymore. Yeah, if, if I could offer something in this space, um... My name is Cameron. I, I work for, um, I'm on the DevOps team in the Apple Pay space. So we have highly scrutinized changes. Uh, but um, the, the trick also is to make it as frictionless as possible where the developers don't even see it. We implemented a webhook out of GitHub into ServiceNow and just to uh, do that. And it, the developers love it. The, the, the more friction... ServiceNow is a highly high friction tool. The form is about 10 pages long and it's hard to, but if you take that away from them and you make it as frictionless as possible and we convinced our cab board that, hey, the pipeline is doing all the checking for you. So therefore one change, one CR, one change, one CR and they loved it. So that's how we got to that point. Yeah, I mean, we did too. If you're doing a low impact change, it takes a couple of milliseconds instead of you know, a long time <laughs> to raise a change control. Yeah, when I joined the team, the people, the developers were out in the hallway, the SRE were out in the hallway screaming, who's got an open change request? I want to deploy something. <laughs> and so the angle we took was, you're, you're moving 50 files into production uh, on this once umbrella CR, whereas I can change it to, 
like you said, one change, one file, one CR. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is asking about DevOps assessments and maturity <laughs> models. So maturity models aren't a thing because no one's mature and it's, it inspires cargo culting, but uh, <laughs> DevOps assessments, I think the right kind of DevOps assessment where you're trying to understand what the, how the team works and compare it to what good looks like so that you can help them out, right? Uh, I know Dora's got an assessment on their, their Google site that I, I think is very valuable. I'd, I'd recommend teams take it just so that they can kind of understand what good looks like. And we have a similar assessment inside this, that's uh, something that te it's voluntary teams can go take it. It talks about things like what's your, what's your uh, uh, like code review process like, so they can kind of compare themselves to what good looks like for code review. But when it comes to maturity models, the only, the only measure of maturity is outcome. Uh, just like, you know, agile is another one, right? I tell people, people ask me, well, how do I know how agile I am? Well, are you delivering a lot and it's high quality? and meeting the customer's needs and you're agile. It doesn't matter if you're doing Scrum or Kanban, I honestly don't care. Um, it, you know, and it's the same with DevOps. You know, are we flowing value correctly to the end user? Are, are we able to meet their needs? Are we reducing waste, reducing cost of change? You know, how much does a change cost? How do we get that price down um, and still deliver value? That's, we're maturing at DevOps. I think the biggest problem that I've seen with those assessments or maturity models is when they're given to all the teams, all the teams have to take them and someone goes and compiles those results and looks at it to see which teams are better than the other teams, where it's not something that the teams actually have an investment in wanting to use just for themselves to see how to improve. But when they're like held against a standard of becoming mature or, you know, this is where you need to be without having any real context around how to get there or why it's important. Um, and I've seen them thrown out a lot of times just blindly because we have to be agile. So, you know, management up here is going to say, let's see how agile everybody is um, <laughs> without giving the context or having the teams understand why. I mean, everything really comes back to why. And if we understand why, then we can be invested in doing things more effectively. Well, I've had people asking me this, some of these questions recently. It's like, well, what's the goal for delivery? I said, improving. No, no, but really, what's the goal? I was like, well, <laughs> Are you talking about a 25 million line multi-team monolith or are you talking about a microservice? Which, which one would you, you know, what's the, you know, what's the goal for build time? Are you talking about a 25 million line monolith that needs some remediation? Or are you talking about a microservice? I said, it, you know, it, it depends. It's always improving. And if you say our goal is to deliver once a day and I can deliver three times a day, then why should I improve? Yeah. Bring up a good point there, Dana. I've seen uh, organizations use the maturity models to kind of, you know, hedge teams and kind of pit them against each other. And then two, I think it kind of, a lot of people will talk about implies an end state, which, you know, kind of as both of you guys are talking about, that's not really what we want to say. Oh, we're done. We're DevOps. We're, we can finish. <laughs> uh, so this, this last question, this is exactly what my team does as we help teams improve. And we have a, a pretty disciplined approach to it. We, we recommend tools like uh, mob programming for some things. Um, it doesn't work for all things. Uh, we recommend XP uh, techniques. We focus really heavily on CI. But really what we do is we, we don't focus on process. We, it's again, it's outcomes. Okay, here are your current metrics around how frequently you're integrating code, how long it takes to, to complete a story, how frequently you're delivering defect rates. Here, here's your current core metrics. Here's what good looks like. Now, what's blocking us from getting to good? Let's work and solve this problem together, right? And then we start introducing, hey, have you, have you guys thought about this? You know, and we, we put in working agreements. We have some standardization. We have a working agreement for CI that we know we're doing continuous integration when everybody on the team is pushing code to the trunk at least once a day that's tested and backwards compatible. It can go to flow, it can flow directly to production. We're not worried about it. We have a high degree of confidence that it can go to production. Uh, and if not, the rest of the pipeline will break it. And uh, that's CI, right? And if they're not doing that, it's not CI. 
And our goal is, okay, then why can't we do CI, right? And, and so we, we, we focus on those. Everything else falls into place. They will use the methods that they need on that team to get that done. The tools make no sense if you don't understand the problems. We give them the problem. Come on, Brian, though, we're technology people. We love tools. <laughs> exactly. Especially when telling people force us to use them and we have no idea why. Yeah. <laughs> You know, something that you guys mentioned that made me think about, um, you know, as I talk to people, why do, why are people transforming? Why are they implementing these agile transformation tools or technologies or processes? And so many people actually don't know. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> we want to do the DevOps. Well, and, yeah, actually, <laughs> we want to be right? agile. What is the, what's the outcome? What is, what is the real purpose? No, but it's, it's absolutely true. You know, the paper I'm writing, I open it up and talk about everyone's doing transformation, but transformation only means change. Yeah. We don't want to change. We just want to improve. Yeah. <laughs> so, it gets it gets not transformation. The, just, the revolution that we're going through, it's not the first time, right? It's, I mean, think about the manufacturing line. We're rebuilding the manufacturing line to help us use our brains better. Yeah. 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 In that, in that thought that, uh, you know, I actually have a, I was talking to somebody about this. It's like, you know, if, when you're really doing this well, everything around the entire enterprise changes. And if people aren't comfortable with that, they say, well, we want change. We didn't want like change, right? We just wanted things <laughs> to change, you know, we don't want everything to change. We just wanted the outcomes to change. Well, everything has to change. The outcomes to change. Suck it up, Buttercup. You're on a journey. Let's go get this done. Right? You know, let's be real with each other. You have the outcomes your organization is designed to produce. Right? I put a link in the. Um, go ahead and sorry, Tom. I just want to say I put a link in the chat there for everyone if they want to submit a talk um, to the track. We'd be happy to have you submit something to. Uh, Dana and Brian's talk about DevOps patterns and anti patterns. So we only have a few minutes left and I just want to thank, you know, Dana and Brian for spending a little time with us um, and really appreciate everyone joining us here on the DevOps online meetup. So any uh, final questions before we wrap up? Um, Brian, Brian, Dana, uh, what would we, I think, well, I, I, I understand your message about the outcomes. I think it's clear right now. Uh, what would be the, the metrics, maybe one or two that you recommend to implementing our, in our companies, right? To try to, you know, uh, have impact with managers in terms of value, right? What, what would be that, that, that metric? If you can recommend one or two. Well, it's, I can't do two, I can do more than that. The, <laughs> I'll say that value number one is to be very context specific to whatever thing, right? So you have to come up with the value metrics for that thing. Uh, but focusing on efficiency, number one, don't measure people, only HR measures people, measure teams, that's the lowest common denominator, and how do we make each team more efficient? And so efficient, the, the way we look at that is we, we look at how frequently they're integrating code a day uh, per developer, right? So commits per day per developer, or not commits, but integrations, code, code to, to Trump, right? Uh, again, as an indication of where we need to improve, uh, we, we track defect rates, change fail rates. Um, uh, sorry, my phone. Um, deploy frequency. Um, we track the duration of the pipeline. We also track the duration of a story. And story that the cycle time on a story is something I think is super important for a lot of reasons. We tell them that if you can't get it done in two days, you have too much uncertainty. And uh, I've never been able to estimate more than three days and you can't tell me that you can reliably deliver something if you tell me it's going to take eight days. I don't believe you. Um, but if we're down to two days and I have a really high degree of certainty, which means I've got good information flowing in so that I can do test-driven development, which you should be doing. But even if you're not, you have the information to test correctly before you commit the code because you have good understanding of how it's supposed to behave. It, that one thing, shrinking that story size, makes everything downstream so much better. And we focus on uh, behavior-driven development to teach them how to shrink that story size. Uh, yeah, flow efficiency, absolutely. If I had a way to measure it, 
uh, you know, without doing it manually, we would absolutely focus on flow efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, hey, Dana and Brian, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody joining us. Um, we'll get the recording out. But like I said, make sure you submit a talk. Dana and Brian would love to have you guys part of their track on the DevOps Online Summit. So thank you guys so much and appreciate everyone joining us. Thanks, Tom. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, DevOps Online Summit, please. Excellent. If, if anybody has Join follow-up us. questions, just hit me up on LinkedIn or hit Dana up on LinkedIn. We're happy to answer. I have one. I have one. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, buddy.